welcome everyone to Saturday service. It's great to see everybody here inside with us. Welcome to those that are in the parking lot and to those also watching Facebook Live over in Building C. Someday soon, we'll all be in the same place. Won't that be a glorious day? Amen for that, yes. Well, here we are waiting for that glorious day. And it reminded me of a song that we sang the first time we opened up the sanctuary for services during the recent crisis. And it was called Church Take Me Back. And it just fit how I feel about the church and about us trying to get everybody together. So if you know it, please sing along with me. Otherwise, just enjoy and prepare to worship. There was a time I swore I would never go back I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had I was running, I was searching But every place I turned for healing Left me more broken than the last Take me back to the place that feels like home to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a nurse, where they see me at my worst, the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. Tried to walk on my own, but a round of loss. Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross. It's not a trophy for the winners. It's a shelter for the sinners. And it's right where I belong. Take me back to the place that feels like home. To the people I can depend on. To the faith that's in my bones. Take me back. To a preacher and a verse Where they see me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church I want to go to church Oh, more than an obligation it's our foundation, the family of God. I know it's hard, but we need each other. We're sisters and brothers. Oh, take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse When they see me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church I want to go to church to uh, those who are out in the parking lot or in building uh, C, and also uh, welcome to uh, everyone as we worship today and give our praise and adoration. You notice that there's only one pastor today, and uh, you get what you get, okay? All right, <laughs> because Pastor Duff is in St. Louis, uh, and he's uh, uh, visiting finally his in-laws uh, with Leo uh, before he starts walking, they wanted to see him, and, uh, and uh, they're having a joyful time up there. He was also able to go and uh, have lunch out with our seminarian, uh, Kent Estes, uh, uh, took a break from his Greek a little bit, and uh, so they had a good time uh, doing that. Uh, take the bulletin with you. There's announcements in there. wanted to just mention that David's uh, men's Bible study on Monday evenings is taking a little bit of a break, but they'll start on August the 17th again. And uh, that is on Monday at 8 o'clock in uh, Classroom 1 in Building E. 
with a study of Joshua. And then the Faithful Readers Book Club meets this Monday at 11 in Building E also. Of course, social distancing there. They pick out a book that they read during the month, and then they uh, come in and discuss it and talk about it and talk about other things I'm, I'm thinking too, okay? And then uh, at 9.30 on Sunday morning, uh, for those of you that are asking, we do have a small uh, Sunday school, socially distanced and stuff, and David is running that at, uh, during the 9.30 time after the kids' message. And then also the La Paz tournament is still going on August the 8th, and there are some slots available for golfing, and there's a sign up in the back, and there's also a little auction for a total wine thing uh, back there. And uh, you're certainly welcome to go ahead and bid if you'd like, but just don't outbid me, okay? All right. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to tell you what my bid was. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> May God's blessing be with, <laughs> be with us as we worship him today. We're going to begin with Psalm 34. It's on the bottom of page one in your bulletin and also up on the monitors. Uh, let us rise for that show. <clears throat> in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We sing, Come, Let Us Worship. Come, let us worship and bow down before the Lord most holy, before the King of glory. Come, and lay your burdens down before the friend who's faithful, before the one who's able. For he is our God, and we are His people, for He is our God, and we will never be forsaken. Come, let us lift our voice in praise to the rock of ages, to the God who saves us. Come and glorify his name, all the earth together, all the saints forever. For he is our God, and we are His people, for He is our God, and we will never be. You are our God. And we are your people. You are our God. And we will be with you. You are our God. And we will be with you. Of which I am ashamed, but some is known only to you. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me that I may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. In that forgiveness, we can now go out and serve others and him. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we begin with the first lesson for today, familiar words from Isaiah 44. I'll have just one comment about them. First reading is from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. I have, told, I have not told you from old and declared it, and you are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Now, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about that lesson, uh, maybe have a little bit of a quiz, I would suppose. I think probably Ken Estes by live stream in St. Louis uh, is going to be uh, watching tomorrow morning. However, if he's not, uh, I've got a little quiz for him. And also, I would suppose for uh, Johanna, who is in the back. But I'd like to start by talking about beginnings and ends. A little quiz, okay? What is it, uh, or what type of letter is it that starts every sentence? Good. Capital letter is the beginning. What is the beginning of the day? Sunrise. Okay, that's very good. Now let's talk about endings, I would suppose and maybe just a, a, a little bit of a quiz for ending. What happens at the end of every movie? You have the credits at the end of every movie. Beginnings and endings. Um, actually, the Isaiah passage here uh, talks, that Sonia just read, talks about that. But it says not endings and beginnings, but it says, I am the first and the last. And again, a little quiz for our seminarian, because all he's doing this summer is taking Greek classes. Uh, what is the, and those of you who are in college, uh, maybe fraternities better not answer this, but uh, what's the first letter of the Greek alphabet? Alpha, and the last letter of the Greek alphabet is Omega, you guys got it, okay? Matter of fact, it's not the season of the year, but the pyramids that we have that go here uh, have the A, Alpha, and the, it looks like a horseshoe, but it's not. It's called the Omega, the first and the last. And the, that's, what, uh, that's what Isaiah is prophesying in the words of God, that he is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He was with you at the beginning of your life here on earth, and he will be with you in the last of your life here on earth. But interestingly enough, the Bible is very, it's, it's, it's an impossible concept for me anyway to get around, uh, but God was before. How could something be before the beginning? But God was before the beginning, and he also will be after the end also. He is all in all. What's the ending of a prayer? Ah, let's do that, shall we? <laughs> Almighty God, you have been with us at the beginning of our life and the end of our life. Assure us that no matter what happens in the middle, you will be with us there also. And all God's people say, Amen. Okay, good. Let's do the second lesson now. This is the basis for the sermon meditation. Uh, we kind of focusing uh, a little bit on uh, verse 22 right in the middle uh, about the whole creation. Second reading is from Romans. This, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. To purity, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. 
that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise if you're able to, uh, so that we can hear the words of Jesus himself out of respect for that. Uh, last parable was the parable of the sower last week. With that same analogy, in Matthew chapter 13, he's in a boat by Capernaum, Looking out, uh, the, looking out over the fields and over... All. Put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell my, the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. Praise Christ. Let's uh, sing, shall we, the sermon hymn. Uh, it's about creation, and we're talking a little bit about that today. Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation. Water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. Holy. Universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning. I will celebrate the light when I stumble in the darkness. Oh. 
until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groans too deep for words. That's part of the text. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus, a friend of mine. Uh, I apologize to the guys outside. Uh, I usually uh, uh, print up my slides and give them to you. Uh, I'll make sure that that happens next week for sure. Uh, but I think you could follow along with that. You know, 20 years ago, something happened over on the West Coast. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember the news articles about that or not, but I was reading one of those things that says, whatever happened to this or whatever happened to that. Ted Williams, who was that? A baseball player. His claim to fame was what? His batting average, he was the last uh, batter in the uh, majors to hit in a season 400, actually. He's a very, very great man. And uh, he had two children, actually. And he talked a little bit about each of them, what he wanted to, uh, to happen after he had died. And uh, you would think that each of those children would know the meaning of the phrase, rest in peace. But that didn't happen because one of the children uh, wanted him cremated and, uh, and his body back where he was born at. And the other one, because he had talked about it a little bit, wanted to do the cryogenic thing where you would freeze the body and then hopefully maybe 50 or 100 years later, they'd, they'd find, the, uh, they'd find the, through science the uh, cure for whatever you had died from 
somehow bring you back to life or something like that. Which one won that argument? The witch? No, it was the cryogenics. Brian, you're right. Okay, all right. Uh, and still to this day, his uh, part of his body is over in Sarasota, and uh, it's frozen. And but they beheaded him and put his head in uh, uh, in in deep freeze and kind of like a lobster pot or something like that. <laughs> That's true. Okay, you know, uh, the search for immortality. Uh, has, of course, been constant in people throughout all times. What did the Egyptians do? Mummies, exactly right, okay. Uh, where, what happened to Lenin's body in Russia? It was uh, preserved, and it's still under a glass dome where people walk by, and they can see him preserved exactly the same way as he died. But you know, the scriptures give us a whole better solution than that. And we see it here in Romans chapter 8. In his word, God clearly gives this different perspective. He says that, <laughs> that, that after death, our bodies will be permanently and completely and wholly restored in the way that he intended them to be. The, the, the world, Romans 8 says here, is, is a world of frustration and suffering. And a lot of times we want to change things in the world. And nobody's got to tell us, do we, that the world is full of all creation itself. The world that we live in is not a perfect thing. We can look around. We can read the newspapers if we want. We can see it for ourselves. Uh, there's one whole book of the Bible named Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament uh, that spends most of its time, 12 chapters, uh, not with flowery language or something like that. There is that reference about there's a time for all things, a time to be born, a time to die. But it spends almost the entire book from Solomon speaking of life as a frustrating and a futile attempt to make some meaning out of life. The book begins, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I had all the money I wanted, King Solomon says, and it didn't make any difference. I built all the buildings I wanted, I had 700 wives, and da da da, on and on and on, and it really is all vanity and all futile. In truth, a, a, a atheist, an atheist viewpoint of the world that we live in leads to that same conclusion. What's the use? What's the sense of it all? One of, um, one of his most, uh, I suppose, popular short stories, uh, American writer in the last century, Ernest Hemingway, uh, oftentimes spoke about the futility of life and one of his short stories was entitled A Clean, Well-Lighted Place. And it relates the tale of a kind of a sad tale of a bartender who after work goes to another bar that's open for the, almost the remainder of the night. He's unable or unwilling to come to grips really with the nothingness and the uselessness and the meaninglessness of life the most important thing for him becomes having a clean, well-lighted place where he's able to read by that light. And he ends by using the Spanish word for nothing to describe his existence. I'm not sure if you know what it is. He used the Lord's Prayer, and it said, Our nada which art in nada, nada be thy name. If you don't have God, yeah, what are you going to replace it with? The answer in a real sad and a haunting way is truly nada. 
at age 63. <laughs> he and his head and a shotgun had a meeting together. The Apostle Paul transfers that frustration and meaninglessness of life even to creation itself when it says that the whole creation which God originally made as very good, if you remember in Genesis chapter 1, uh, then when sin came into the world, there was this decay, and it has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth ever since. It, it's not, the world is not the way God, even creation itself, <laughs> you know, there aren't going to be any hurricanes in heaven. There aren't going to be any tidal waves and all that type of a thing. That's really the result of sin coming into the beautiful world that God made. It's also frustrating. And ultimately, it will be restored originally the way God intended. The second Peter says, it will be a new heaven and a new earth. There are aspects, aren't there, of our world which are beautiful, aren't they? And unfortunately, sometimes we, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes we, uh, we get in the way of God's perfect good creation, don't we? Uh, a few years back, I uh, went on a turtle watch at uh, Cape Canaveral National Seashore. Very interesting thing. I'm not sure if they have it right now, but I know that they will be having it. You may have to make a reservation, of course, and you go to the, uh, to the center, uh, the uh, nature center that's uh, up there. Uh, not far from Black Rock uh, Wildlife uh, Drive. And uh, they have a presentation and everything. It's usually like 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And they have a presentation. This is during turtle season. What is it? Uh, April, May, and June. Uh, and uh, you, you go up there and they do this presentation and everything. The ranger is there with orientation and stuff. And, and eventually you say, this ranger is just trying to make up some stuff here to, to, for time. And that's exactly what the ranger is doing because they have spotters out at the National uh, Seashore. And when a spotter finally spots a turtle that is laying an egg, then you all get into your cars and everything else like that. And you go out into, uh, uh, onto the beach. And with the aid of red flashlights, uh, you're able to watch that whole process, in including what they did for us was like, you know, uh, we'd be in trouble if we did it, but they passed an egg around to everybody. It's almost like a soft ping pong ball is, is, is what it is. And it was just a, a marvelous experience of being out in God's creation. Because, you know, you had the, the, the waves and the ocean and the turtle and da, 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 and everything else like that. And uh, the turtle didn't mind at all. In fact, they kind of go into a trance. Actually, when they when they when they when they lay it, however, after she was done laying her eggs and took about 20 minutes for her to cover up the hole, she was ready to go back into the sea. And there she starts. She sensed that there was probably about 15 people off to the side, uh, and so uh, she she kind of headed out in the other direction to the ocean. But then comes the marine biology patrol. Okay, <laughs> and it looked like this. Okay. <laughs> With the turtle right there, okay, all right. And the poor turtle, with us watching, there was a couple of four-wheel beach buggies, and they, they pulled her back to, to measure her, and to poke her, and to prod her, and to weigh her, and to take some blood samples. They attached a cuter, a cuter chip to her uh, flipper, and on and on and on and on. That frustrated turtle was finally allowed to return to the sea. <laughs> but my point is, what had been a perfectly natural, <laughs> beautiful thing, uh, uh, and part of God's creation had become kind of totally frustrated. And of course, I know there's value in marine biology and all of that, but I thought to myself, oh my goodness, <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful scene this was and how it became almost a circus. And you wondered whether that turtle would ever go back there again. <laughs> You know, you know uh, that's a little bit what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter 8. Uh, uh, how often does it happen that what began as a beautiful, natural, one could say God-pleasing thing turns into a hopeless mess? It happens in the world. It happens in our lives sometimes. And it certainly happens also in our spiritual lives. And to that the Apostle Paul tells us 
to look in hope because God has done something about the hopeless nada of our life and all its frustration. God is in control. We have that assurance even when the events of this world and creation itself don't make sense. Yeah, we might have to wait a while for explanation. We might have to wait years later. We may even have to wait until heaven. But he says here, if we hope for what we do not yet have, we can wait for it patiently. And then he goes on and he says, while we are waiting, sometimes in hopelessness, sometimes in futility, sometimes in a sense of meaninglessness, it's almost like, you ever had that experience? You just don't even know what to pray for. And you're just kind of helpless. A beautiful passage here in Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, in our nada moments, I would suppose. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You hear that? You don't have to even have the words. Because even when we can't pray, and we feel dry, and we feel hopeless and helpless. It says, the Spirit takes over for us with groans too deep for words. Just as that happens. And if you're in that situation, <laughs> don't try to force it. Just let God's Spirit Speak to your soul. And maybe not even in verbal words, but speak through you to God. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know what that next verse is? And we know that in all things... <laughs> God works for good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, this whole thing about creation groaning, about us groaning, about our groaning because of our sins and things like that, we need to take that to the foot of the cross. And we need to know that just like God has said, even if there is suffering, we have glory to look forward to. There is a future in our personal lives. God has seen to it already in the gift of his son, knowing that we could never do anything to relieve that nada frustration caused by our sin and the toll of sin. So he steps in with the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And it's in the midst of all those frustrations, the brokenness, the pain and the suffering which Christ bore on the cross, uh, in the middle of that, through faith in him, we can be freed, it says, from the bondage of sin and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. He has made us a new creation in baptism. He continues to give us that new life in holy communion. He will restore, not just this creation, but he will restore our souls, even when it seems like it's hopeless. Have any of you ever been to Bouchard Gardens in British Columbia, Victoria, British Columbia? Whoa! Have you been there? <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place that is. It started out in the early 1900s as a limestone quarry. And the wife of the limestone quarry uh, owner decided rather than leave it like that, <laughs> that
that she would begin restoring that place and make it a beautiful garden. And it's a little bit hard to see, but at the very beginning there, how awful it looked. And if you ever get out there and look, it's just absolutely gorgeous, marvelous restoration of God's creation. It's almost an image of what God is going to do for us. Listen to the last book of the Bible, uh, Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb to the middle of the street of the city also, and on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees were for the healings of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. And they will not need the light of a lamp for sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Yeah, our world groans, <laughs> and creation itself seems subject to futility, and our lives sometimes feel that way. But have that assurance that God is a God of restoration not just for the world, but for your life also. Amen. May the peace of God which passes understanding keep our hearts in that faith in Christ. Now, let's continue, shall we, with the Nicene Creed. We haven't done this one in a while, uh, but it's a, it's a little bit more of an extensive confession of our faith in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit than the Apostles' Creed. It's on page five of our worship service, uh, and then we'll have a little anthem as I take the prayer request, if you have some. Let's go ahead and speak that together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us at the Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, not of one baptism for the remission of sin. And I look for the resurrection and the life. Let's continue as we listen to the anthem, Angels Gather Around Your Throne. And if you have a special prayer petition, you can use one of those green cards or give it to me uh, as I'm walking around. <laughs> Thank you. 
your feet and at your feet they bend their knees all creatures on the earth below bow before you now And now we continue with our prayers, and our prayers we keep uh, first for the family and friends of Jim Bunky, uh, Saturday Night Worshipper. We had a short uh, a memorial service for it just uh, before church today. Uh, we also keep in our prayers uh, Cheryl Richards, uh, that God would continue to grant her healing at 930 service. Uh, we pray for all of those who are suffering from emotional issues, that God would strengthen and be with them, uh, whatever age they may happen to be. Uh, let's rise, shall we, for prayer. Father, we know that you looked at your creation and you said it is good, it is very good. We know also that because of the sin beginning with Adam and Eve, it became not so good. But we know also that your plan was for restoration, beginning with the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, to restore us back to you. We pray, Almighty God, that you would be with our creation now, even as it groans from, from all kinds of situations and circumstances. Help us to do what we can to alleviate that, but help us to realize also that it's ultimately in heaven that there will be perfect restoration. Lord, in your mercy, be with those who are in the hospitals now. In particular, we pray that you would be with uh, Cheryl Richards, uh, that you would also, Almighty God, be with uh, William Chemnitz as he is suffering in the hospital and gravely ill. We pray that you would assure him that even though he cannot be right there with his family, that you are there and they can still hear, he can still hear their words of comfort. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray that you be with those who are in emotional turmoil in their life. Uh, be, whether it's hopelessness of life itself, whether it's situations or circumstances, assure them that there is meaning, that there is purpose. Help us to be your hands and feet as we just listen and serve and be a friend to them. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup when he had supped and given thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. With you. We pray, we give thanks to thee, Almighty God, that you will refresh us with this salutary gift. And we beseech thee that of thy mercy thou would strengthen us to the same, in faith toward thee and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Bless we the Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
Um, you may now be seated as at the direction of the ushers, we have Holy Communion.
this world can satisfy. And what of trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights, all your mercies in disguise. Sometimes at night, I am afraid. Cover my eyes, cover my shame. So here in the dark, broken apart. Come with your light, fill up my heart. Oh, great light of the world, fill up my soul. I've never met you. Come make me whole.
For ELCA, you're not too bad. Pardon? For ELCA, you're not too bad. <laughs>